welcome your cards and letters of comment. Our mailing address is Nightline, WDAF, Kansas City, Missouri, 64108. Thank you for listening and good night. WDAF, Kansas City. Dan Henry, WDAF Local News at 11 o'clock. The outlook for Kansas City, clearing and warmer. The Board of Education in Kansas City plans to seek contempt charges against striking teachers for their failure to honor an injunction against the strike. Board members met today and directed attorneys to file for the contempt citations this coming Monday. The work stoppage now is 19 days old. Talks are centering on higher wage demands by the teachers. Kansas City police say they've released a 17-year-old arrested with three other youths today in the killing of cab driver Lawrence Hoover yesterday. The teenager was released after questioning tonight. Still held are three youths ages 14 and 15. Police say Hoover was killed during a robbery attempt yesterday on the east side of Kansas City. An elderly Kansas City woman was killed today in a two-vehicle wreck in the north part of Kansas City. The highway patrol identifies the victim as 72-year-old Ruth Henry. Troopers say the woman's car swerved into the passing lane of Interstate 35 to avoid a car stopped in her lane. Her vehicle was hit by a tractor-trailer rig and was pushed 135 feet into the median. Former prisoner of war Joseph Charles Plum has second thoughts about running for political office in Kansas this year, saying today from his home in suburban Kansas City that the contribution he could make to politics wouldn't be worth the personal sacrifice this year. The city of Independence, Missouri, will appeal a court ruling that knocked out a city ordinance prohibiting sale of liquor by the drink on Sunday. That ordinance ruled invalid Monday by the Missouri Court of Appeals at Kansas City. News of the hour on the hour from American Information Radio. This is Richard Wall from Los Angeles. And at this hour, former White House aide Dwight Chapin says he'll continue to fight to prove his innocence following his perjury conviction today. Correspondent Vic Ratner reports from Washington. The jury deliberated long and hard, more than 11 hours. Chapin and his family passing the time playing backgammon in a nearby witness room. Finally, the verdict. Guilty on two of three charges of lying to the grand jury. Chapin took the verdict impassively. The judge set May 15th for his sentence, which could run up to 10 years in jail. After the jury left, Chapin walked over and kissed his wife. She and his mother broke down crying. Vic Ratner, ABC News at the Federal Courthouse in Washington. The President's Brother's Testimony. That story coming up. What happens when your personal battle suddenly changes from this to this? Well, I realize you've spent the past three years on assignment in Asia, sir, but we just don't have any jobs right now that need that kind of training. Now, if you only had a diploma... Or this. Oh, a mess. You must have gone three years without seeing a dentist. They have to do a root canal here and fill these three. If you are a recent veteran, there are people just waiting to help you cope with the battles of civilian life. They are the representatives of your American Red Cross. Did you know that you are entitled to free VA dental care during your first year out of the service? Do you know what programs are available to help you complete your education or to find a better job? For more information about these and other problems of civilian life, call your local Red Cross chapter. Let the American Red Cross help with your personal battle. President Nixon's brother Edward has testified for the defense in the perjury conspiracy trial of John Mitchell and Maurice Stans. We asked ABC's Gregory Jackson in New York about the testimony. In effect, Nixon said two things. Number one, he said, no, Stans did not demand a uh, contribution from Vesco in cash. He said he'd take it in check as well. But he said if Vesco was uh, serious about remaining an anonymous donor and never to be known, then cash was probably the best way. So, Edward Nixon said, he passed the word on to Vesco, give in cash if you can. Correspondent Jackson said before Edward Nixon took the stand, one of the 16 counts against Mitchell and Stans was dismissed by federal judge Lee Gagliardi. About 50 federal centers will open this weekend in southern and midwestern states hit by tornadoes late Wednesday and early Thursday. The centers will give people help with loans, tax and legal advice, food stamps and other questions. 
A federal official says the number of dead from the tornadoes could be far higher than the 299 now reported if it hadn't been for the tornado warning system. FBI agents have used a search warrant to get information sent to the San Francisco underground newspaper, The Phoenix, by Patricia Hearst kidnappers. The documents from the Symbionese Liberation Army were at the offices of the Phoenix's attorney. And the newspaper's editor, John Bryan, tells us... Everything that the SLA has sent, sent to the examiner, sent to me, sent to KPFA, has been made public, as the SLA requested it to be. There isn't one word there that the FBI doesn't, it can't have access to for, by running down to the corner and paying 15 cents for a newspaper. Brian says he can't understand the reason for the raid, but the FBI says the material from the SLA is criminal evidence. President Nixon is one of some 40 heads of government now in Paris for tomorrow's memorial services for French President Georges Pompidou. Elections to choose a successor to Pompidou are scheduled for May 5th, with a runoff May 19th if nobody wins a majority. Candidates for the French presidency have till April 16th to file. South Vietnam's military command says two grenade explosions killed 11 people and wounded more than 100 Friday night. The command blames the Viet Cong for the incidents at two towns within 30 miles of Saigon. Prices of Toyota cars and trucks will be going up an average of $150 in the U.S. This is Information Radio News. From the Kirk Murr Sports Desk, an estimated 35,000 fans saw a close game as the home opener and the season began in Kansas City. The Kansas City Royals playing the Minnesota Twins at Royal Stadium. Hank Aaron will play in Cincinnati tomorrow. That could be the day the long-standing Babe Ruth home run record could be broken. Raytown South has lost its head football coach. Vance Morris has resigned that position to be an assistant football coach at Austin College in Sherman, Texas. And World Indoor Mile record holder Tony Waldrop of North Carolina has accepted an invitation to run in the annual Kansas Relay the 17th through the 20th of this month in Lawrence. The new Kansas City forecast calls for clear skies and a low in the upper 30s tonight, mostly sunny tomorrow with a high in the upper 60s. Dan Henry, WDAF News. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... apartment building, and in broad daylight. I don't want to die, George, please. I don't want to die. Margaret, darling, listen to me. No, no. Margaret, it would be better. Better for who? For you, dear, for you. I have very little left, George. Please, just let me live a little longer. Margaret, life means nothing to you now. I know, but just let me live a little bit Longer. I can't, Margaret. I can't. Our mystery drama, The Man Who Heard Voices, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Larry Haynes. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg Special K cereal, and by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. And now another tale of the ball and chain. Act Kellogg's Special K presents the good, the bad, and the heavy. Why is that cowboy wearing a ball and chain? Because carrying around extra pounds could be just like carrying around a ball and chain. How symbolic. What would it be, senor? Give me the Special K breakfast. Here you go. Ball and Special K. It's the milk on a juice and coffee. Ah. Say, don't I know you from some place? You probably don't recognize me with my ball and chain. I used to be ten pounds lighter, but I'm getting back that way by exercising and eating smart at every meal. Start with this here Special K breakfast. What's so special? It's less than 240 calories, 99% fat-free, and delicious. It's going to help me get rid of this here ball and chain. The 
I'll bet your horse will be glad to hear that. Another ball and chain. Fight the dust. Your happy ending could begin with the Kellogg's Special K breakfast. That's Kellogg's Special K. That's right. Good night. <laughs> 1919, someone had a big idea. Let's help youth understand big business by starting them in small businesses of their own. And Junior Achievement was born. Each group elected a board of directors, chose a product, set up a production line, sold stock, and went into business. That year, 314 students made and sold products and learned the business of business. <laughs> Today, Junior Achievement has grown to nearly 200,000 members. Junior Achievers are designing and marketing their own products and services, from cutting boards to printing. They're organizing sales efforts, writing marketing plans, calculating profit and loss. Running these small businesses helps Junior Achievers understand how big business works. Support Junior Achievement, where youth learns the business of business. Call your local Junior Achievement office. Forty-two, George Wesley Sanderson is handsome, intelligent, and wealthy. He is married to a most beautiful woman. He is a partner in a prestigious law firm. He has a host of friends because he is gracious, considerate, sensitive, and obliging. And so, you look at him sipping his morning coffee in his luxurious apartment in New York City, and you say to yourself, Here indeed is one of fortune's favorites. How wonderful life must be for George Wesley Sanderson. But we have invaded his privacy. We have caught him alone and off guard. And so we see a look of terror in his eyes. And no wonder, because George Wesley Sanderson hears a voice. A woman's voice. my pills, George. The voice is clear and distinct. But George is alone in the room. My pills! George? Not only is George Wesley Sanderson alone in the room, but the voice belongs to a woman ten years dead. Margaret. Margaret. George, you must give me my pills. No, no, no. George! Somebody has to work. Oh, come on. That silly place runs itself. Goodbye, dear. Georgie, are you sure you're all right? Y yes, yes. I'm, I'm fine. And uh, really, I, I have to get to the office. I notice you'd rather get to the office than fly to me. Darling, it's not what I'd rather do. It's what I have to do. My next husband will be a man with absolutely no ethics at all. Goodbye. My name, as you know is George Wesley Sanderson. And I must talk to somebody, unburden myself, but there is nobody. Oh, my wife loves me, my father-in-law is most understanding, I have good friends. I could confess to a priest, visit a psychiatrist, but you see, each in his own way would fail me because no one would accept the basic point of my problem. No one would ever believe that that I'm a man who hears voices. There are times when I can hear what people think, what they're going to think. And there are times when I can hear people who are miles away or... or even dead. It started, oh, 15 years ago. 
I was married to my first wife then. Her name was Margaret. She was 23 years old, vivacious, active, loved sports. She could even beat me in tennis, but she did it with such charm, I didn't mind it a bit. That's out. Oh, that looked in to me. Okay. <laughs> if you want the point, you can have the point. You should have a handicap anyhow. Okay. Just look out for this ace. <laughs> huh. An ace. How'd you like that, huh? I say, how'd you like that? Margaret? Margaret, is something wrong? No. I'm fine. Well, you had a funny look on your face. Did I? It's just... Just what? Nothing, nothing. I... I I just had a funny little twinge in my back. But it's gone now. Your serve. Then in there I heard a voice. It was the voice of our doctor. You both know the truth. We don't know what's wrong with Margaret. She won't be able to walk. She'll have to stay in bed. For a while, anyway. These pills will keep her alive. Exactly one year later, the doctor spoke those very words to us in the hospital. You uh, sent for me, Mr. Cartwright? Yes, George, sit down. Thank you, sir. George, I, uh, I read your brief on the Hollingsworth case. Brilliant. Is that what you'd like to specialize in? Criminal law? Yes, sir. Good. This firm could use a crackerjack trial lawyer. Uh, let's have dinner one night this week and start making some plans for you. Well, sir, I, uh, really can't go out much at night. You know? No, you see, uh, my, my wife is, uh, bedridden. Oh, well, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, we, uh, we don't even know what it is. One of those uh, mysterious ailments. Anyhow, she uh, has to have constant attention. I have a woman who stays with her during the day, but at night, I can't leave her alone. Hmm. Well, that's too bad. We'll arrange for lunch, perhaps. Then I heard his voice. His silent voice. But to me, it was crystal clear. That's all for now, George. I just wanted to let you know how pleased I am with your work. And the other partners are, too. Well, thank you, sir. Hi, Dad. Your secretary said you were busy, but I'll only be a minute. <laughs> well, hello. Who is this? Uh, this is one of our new young attorneys, George Wesley Sanderson. My daughter, Sally. How do you do? George Wesley Sanderson. Even sounds like a great lawyer. <laughs> now, dear, save that ravishing smile for where it'll do you some good. George Sanderson is a married man. And once again, I heard a voice. Sally's voice. I don't care if he is married. I want him. I never believed it, but now I know it's absolutely true. There is such a thing as love at first sight. I love him. Thank you, dear. But I don't want any more. It's time for my pill. Oh, yes, so it is. I'll, uh, I'll get it for you. Those pills, they're like a lifeline. Well, let's be thankful they work. Oh, George. You've become a full-time nurse. And in addition, you've got a full-time job. You really don't get much sleep, darling. You have to set an alarm every two hours to give me my pill. Darling, we stood up together and we took a vow for richer, for poorer, for better, for worse. In sickness and health. Till death do us part. Let's uh, change the subject, huh? Okay. 
Well, how'd it go at work today? Oh, uh, everybody flipped for the way I handled the Hollingsworth case. Oh, will it mean a promotion? Well, maybe, but more important is the additional money. Oh, George. Now what? If you become important, we'll be expected to entertain Oh, no, no, nothing of the sort. I'm going to run my business the way I want. I intend to do my work during the day, in the office. I don't have to socialize with people. Merit, ability, that's what should count. And for the third time that day, I heard a voice. This time, Margaret's. Oh, Lord. I'm not much use. I can't do a thing. I'm a drag of the man I love. I'm good for absolutely nothing. But I want to live. And we have a clear precedent here. When Theodore Roosevelt was uh, police commissioner of the city of New York, the question of injury incurred while making a citizen's arrest... Do you always oh. talk to yourself? Oh, I happen to be dictating into this recording. How did you get in here? <laughs> Being the boss's daughter ought to give a girl certain privileges. I came by hoping you might have pity on me. Pity? I'm famished. You might take me to lunch. Well, uh... Well, what? It wouldn't hurt you with the chief. Might even pave the way to a promotion. Well, on the other hand, it might backfire. How? Well, how does your father regard married male employees who take his daughter to lunch? I don't know. It's never happened before. As you legal types might say, there are no precedents. Come on. Take a chance. Live dangerously. I'll give my hat. <laughs> Darling, I'm sorry. I need my pill. No, it's okay. It's okay, darling. Here you are, dear. Thank you. There. Now, just uh, let me set the alarm again. You must be exhausted. No, 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 not really. Are you uh, feeling any better? Yes, a little. I was so tired when you came home, though, we couldn't even talk. And I looked forward to our talk so much. Anything interesting happened today? Oh, uh, no, no, just a lot of routine. What did you have for lunch? Lunch? Uh, lunch, let's see, uh, I just had a sandwich at the desk. Oh, George, you should go out. No, no, dear, no, I shouldn't. <laughs> But I did. She would drop by two, three times a week. And it just became, well, a, a thing we did. We were friends, that's all. I knew she was in love with me, but I was discovering something else. Something very unsettling, very disturbing. I was falling in love with her, too. I tried to fight it. Right here. Okay. There. Well, now that uh, we've scared away every fish between here and Europe... <laughs> I wouldn't know what to do with a fish if I caught one. Well, uh, let's just drift for a bit, huh? You didn't have to say that. Say what? Drift. Haven't we been doing just that since the day we met? Yes, yes, I suppose we have. What are we going to do, George? I, uh, I don't know. I'm willing to settle. Settle? For half a loaf. Oh, no, 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 that, that wouldn't work. After a while, you'd get to hate me. No, George, I wouldn't. Well, I'd hate myself. Do you still love her? No. No, it's a terrible thing, but I, I don't love her anymore. You know, that happens to people. Just as they can fall in love, they can also fall out of love. It's, it's just that the timing and the circumstances are bad for Margaret and for me. But if you no longer love her... Well, how could I ever divorce her? Hey, hey, where are we going? I don't know. But the one thing I can't do is just to stand still. Nothing and no 
no one in this world ever really stands still. Wheels are always turning. Gears are shifting. Minds are changing. Perhaps slowly, imperceptibly, subtly. Even a marriage vow contains the seeds of its own dissolution. For it says, until death do us part. We'll be back shortly with Act Two. Young I may be, but still I'm a man. Turn 18 and I'll do what I can. Find me a place where I can be me. Get ready for life to be free. Oh, where do I go from here? Oh, where do I go from here? I'm finished with school. The work lies ahead. Don't want to get trapped. Want to feel free and dead. the new Navy. You'll get your chance of success, learn an exciting job, and see the world. Call toll-free 800-841-8000 or see your Navy recruiter. Be someone special in the new Navy. Time. The steady pace of time. Moving inexorably on and on and on. And all the while, your federal income tax return lies neglected, undone, because you need help and don't know where to turn. And yet the help you seek is close to you, closer than you may realize. The Internal Revenue Service will answer your questions. Just call your nearest IRS office. This year, from coast to coast, The IRS is providing toll-free telephone service to answer your tax questions. Wherever you are, you can call without having to pay for long distance. Just check the phone number listed in your tax form instructions. Let the IRS take the mystery out of your federal income tax this year. George Wesley Sanderson is in a motorboat just off Long Island on a beautiful day with a beautiful woman who loves him. And to make it perfect, he also loves her. However, there's a complication. George Wesley Sanderson is married, and he takes his vow seriously. We'll do something, Sally. You'll have to do something, George. People don't stand still. Yes, I know. You can't freeze a relationship. It grows better every day or it becomes worse. You fall in love because another person has something you need. And sometimes it's the terrible truth. When that person loses what attracted you in the first place, love also goes with it. I know, I know. So many people can't face up to it. They're unable to end a thing that really no longer exists. I love you, Sally. I love you, George, but I'm human. If I can't have you, sooner or later, I'll face it, and then I'll make other arrangements for my life. Sally, wait for me. Oh, I'll wait, George. But I can't promise to wait forever. Just then I heard another voice. It was a voice I'd never heard before, but there was no, no mistaking who it could be and what the meaning was. Do you, George, take Sally for your lawful wedded wife to have and to hold? Oh, Sally, darling, don't ask me how or when or why. <laughs> George, look out. You'll upset the boat. Who cares, Sally? It's going to happen. What's going to happen? You and me, we're going to happen. We're going to be married. But... No buts. Just believe me. I believe you, George. I believe you. Oh, that was good. Oh, 
Oh, it's so hungry. Oh, Margaret, that's a good sign. Oh, I don't know. Sometimes I just wish... What? What do you wish? Oh, nothing, nothing. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. Well, now, you must have had an interesting morning. Oh, just so-so. Well, what was it? What did you have to do with the office? You never did tell me. No, no, I didn't. Well, uh, we had to take a deposition. Oh? And uh, we just spent the morning listening to witnesses. And, uh... Margaret? Margaret? What? Oh, dear, what is it, George? Don't close your eyes yet. It's time for your pill. Here, take it down with some juice. Hannah, that's all we'd have to do, just to get one pill. Oh, George. Darling. Maybe we'd both be better off. Hey, good morning, George. Here, sir. Yeah, sit down. Thank you. Now, George, I, uh... I want you to go to Washington. I know you have personal problems. Yes, sir. I want you to argue the Stillwell case before the Court of Appeals. Well, sir... You I... can win this case for us. You're a natural. Lawyers like you come along once in a generation. Yes, but Mr. Cartwright... The trial date is in six weeks. Now, I'm sure you can find a way to uh, resolve your problem. You can buy nursing care while you're gone. Sir, it's more than that. I'm sure it is. Now, I don't want to intrude in your personal affairs. Although I understand I'm indirectly affected. My daughter, evidently, is uh, quite taken with you. Well, that's between the two of you. I assure you. Of what? The two of you are in love. It's a very difficult situation. But it's your situation. For my part, I need you for the Stillwell trial in Washington... Now, don't, don't give me your answer right now. And then, I heard a voice. And this voice I knew very well because it was my own voice. And I could hear myself say, If it pleases the court, the prosecution claims that the defendant, Adam Stilwell, has committed the crime of high treason against the government of the United States. George. Mm -hmm. George! Oh, what, what, what? Well, that's what I want to ask you. What happened? You turned pale. Is, uh, is everything all right? Oh, uh, yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir, everything's fine. Just fine. I, uh, I mean, I, I, I believe that I will be able to plead the still love case after all. Has she been taking these pills regularly? Oh, religiously, Doctor. The woman we have here in the daytime is absolutely trustworthy, and of course I'm here all night. And he's a tyrant about it, Doctor. Well, he should be. Uh, Doctor, what about Margaret? Well, for the first time since... since this thing struck, I have good news. Uh, good news? I, I say good. These words, good and bad, are... Relative. Yes, but what do you mean by good? Well, for the first time, I can detect no further signs of deterioration. I see. Uh, unless some other complication occurs, Margaret can live on indefinitely, provided she takes her pills on a regular basis. Oh, we'll, we'll see to that, Doctor. We'll see to that. Well, uh, keep in touch if anything unusual happens, and I'll be here again next week. Yes, I'll uh, see you to the door, Doctor. Goodbye, Margaret. Goodbye, Doctor. Oh, a lovely day, isn't it, George? Uh, yes, yes. Oh, uh, about those pills, George. Make sure you never run out. And she must have one every two hours. That's what his speaking voice was saying to me. The little amenities, the weather, don't forget her pills, and so on. But there was another voice. His inner voice. And I could hear it so clearly, so plainly. Poor kids. I'm glad I don't have to decide. She's in such terrible pain. Constantly. Well, that's between the two of them. Or maybe it's up to him. I only know I wouldn't want to be in his shoes for all the money in the world.
Goodbye, George. Goodbye, Doctor, and uh, thank you for everything. George? George? Oh, uh, yes, dear. I'd like a pillow. Yes, dear, I'm coming. Here we are. Now. Mm. Does that feel more comfortable? Mm-hmm. I think so. Margaret, look at me. I'm looking at you, darling. <laughs> to hear her voice. Not her speaking voice, but her thinking voice, her feeling voice, the way I'd heard it once before. But this, this ability, this, this gift, this talent, call it what you will, doesn't work at my command. It comes and goes of its own accord. I wanted to know how she felt, what she really wished for. But try as I might, I, I simply couldn't hear her inner voice. And I knew that the decision, one way or another would have to be mine. All mine, mine alone. I'm looking at you, darling. Margaret, are you in pain? Oh, doesn't matter, really. The pill takes care of it. Oh, it's such a miraculous pill. It takes care of everything. Oh, I think I'd better sleep for a while, George. I, I, I just want to sleep. Margaret, what do you mean? Please tell me, what do, you, what do you mean by by sleep? Margaret? Oh, no, I'll get that. Uh, hello? George? Oh, yes, Mr. Cartwright. Hey, can you arrange to fly to Washington a week from Friday? Uh, a week from Friday? Yes, for a free trial on the Stillwell case. Well, sir, I hadn't expected well, to... Well, uh, you told me just yesterday in the office that you were in with... Well, yes, sir, but that was uh, because I, I, I thought I had six more weeks. Well, you do. This will just involve you down there for a day or two this time. I understand. I'll have Miss Gordon book your flight. Well, uh, a week from Friday, that's uh, that's about ten days, isn't it? Yeah, well, we'll have all the papers for you at the office tomorrow. And I'm taking you off everything else. Just remember, we want this case. Yes, sir. Goodbye, George. Goodbye, sir. George? Mm, oh. Oh, darling, I thought you were asleep. <laughs> the ringing of the phone woke me. I thought it was the alarm for my pill. Oh, no, no. We still have another hour for that. Now, what's supposed to happen a week from Friday? Hmm? Oh, oh, uh, just a lunch date with Mr. Cartwright and uh, a client. He must like you a lot, doesn't he? Well, I'm not really a bad lawyer. <laughs> oh, George. I wish I could be of help to you. I wish there was something I could do. George? Oh, hi. I'm sorry I'm late. Dad tells me how busy you are. I ordered you your extra dry gimlet. Thanks. I could use it. Dad also tells me you're going to Washington. Yes. Uh, that is, I think so. You think so? I understand the plans are all set. Well, the fact is, I uh, know I'll be going, but, uh... But what? Oh, nothing. Once the trial begins, there's no telling how long it may run. These government things can go on for months. Yes, I know. How about... How about Margaret? Yes, Margaret. Let's not talk about Margaret. But, George... Please. I said I'd be satisfied with half a loaf. Right now, I don't want to talk about it. But, George, I'm in... There are things I must decide. I want to help no, you. No, no, no. But when people are in love, there should be no barriers. Nothing held back. Sally. Sally, you have a lot to learn about love. George, I won't be spoken Please, to. Please, Sally, don't press me. Don't push me, huh? I don't care who you are, how deeply you love. There are certain things I must decide on my own. George Wesley Sanderson is faced with a decision. And it's a decision a man doesn't make lightly. Nor does he make it every day. Because what George must decide is whether or not to kill his wife. We shall return shortly with Act Three. Some beer drinkers have funny ideas about beer. They think beer improves with age, like wine. We'll find a brewmaster, though. You'll find a beer drinker who knows better. 
The Budweiser brewmaster says it all depends on how beer is aged. Just letting beer sit in lagering tanks makes it older, not necessarily better. That even goes for keeping a case around the house for a couple of months. But there is one kind of aging that's good for beer. The Budweiser kind. Beechwood aging. In this kind of aging, something happens. It lets all the flavor of the choicest hops and best barley malt that go into Budweiser get through to you. Sure, it takes more time and trouble to brew Budweiser that way. But brewing beer right does make a difference. Anheuser Busch, St. Louis. Thank you, I'm Carol. Carol Channing, wouldn't you like to give an Easter gift that works a long time after you've given it? Well, that's what happens when you give to Easter Seals. Your gift does wonderful things, helping disabled youngsters overcome crippling conditions. They learn to walk and use helpless hands, and some of them learn to speak for the first time in their lives. With the help of the Easter Seal Society, they're becoming active little people, part of life around them. Your gift to Easter Seals is so big to crippled children, helping them do a lot of things other youngsters do. They walk, talk, run, and play, and go to school. They grow up and work and support families. It takes a long time for them to develop their capabilities, but they do it with your help. I hope you'll give to Easter Seals. I know that your gift does work a long time after you've given it. One minute before two in the morning in the apartment of George Wesley Sanderson, an alarm clock is set to go off exactly on the hour. It must awaken George so that he can give his wife, Margaret, a pill. A pill she takes every two hours. Without her regular pill, Margaret will die. George? George, wake up. George? Oh, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, I was afraid for a minute that the clock wouldn't wake you. Yes, I'm sorry. I was sleeping pretty soundly. Poor George, you never get any rest. It's all right, it's all right. Here, Dolly, take your pill. Oh. Thank you, darling. Thank you. And now go go back to sleep. Well, I uh, better reset the alarm. You're so good to me, George. There. There it is. I've set it for four. Good night, darling. Good night. I turned to look at her. Her eyes were closed. She was only 28. But her face was lined. Her skin was drawn and flushed, and she looked old. Where was the pert, vivacious Margaret who only a few months before had been bursting with life? Wasn't she as good or as bad as dead already? Wasn't it a mercy to end her suffering? Wasn't her living merely a sham and a pretense? Suppose I I would somehow forget to give her the next pill. What would I be ending? And then once again I heard the voices. But these were voices from the past. The recent past. This bird could use a cracker jack criminal lawyer. I love you, George. I love you. We have plans for you. I'll wait for you, darling. But I can't promise to wait forever. We're all pleased with your work. Why hold on to a relationship that no longer exists? I can't do it. But I want to live. I want to live. George? George, the alarm. George, wake up. George, it's time for my pill. George, wake up. You must wake up. George? must wait.
wake up. Quiet, Margaret. I'm doing that for you. George. George, I must have my pills. George, wake up. Oh, believe me, Margaret. Please believe me. It isn't Sally or the job. I admit they both get me, but I don't want to see you suffer anymore. Aren't you going to give me my pills? George? Let me live. Just a little longer, please. And I'm so tired, Margaret. So tired. George! George, please. So mixed up. George, don't pretend to be asleep. I'm doing it for you, Margaret. Maybe for me, too, but mostly for you. Oh, George. Darling. I forgive you. I forgive you. Sit down, George. Sit down. Now, you didn't have to come into the office today. Yes, I know, sir, but she's been dead a week, and, uh, well, things go on. I'm due to leave for Washington tomorrow. Yes, uh, we, uh... Well, we wondered whether under the circumstances to ask for a delay. Well, there's no point to that, sir. What I need now is lots of work. Well, <laughs> we have lots of work around here. George, I've been trying to reach you to tell you how sorry... Sally, it's all right. Now, there is a possibility that you people have something to discuss. Excuse me for a moment. Well, Sally... Here we are. Yes. How did it happen, George? Oh, it's something that could have happened at any time. She just uh, fell asleep and uh, and she didn't wake up. And now what, George? And now we can be married. That is, if you'll still have me. Oh, darling. I have to go to Washington. I'll go with you. And you know, of course, what Dad's been talking about. Well, actually, I don't. Well, we're fairly direct people, all of us. Dad was saying that since you and I would be married, there'd be a partnership in the firm as well. Mm -hmm. Well, as long as we're fairly direct people, I may as well tell you that I deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> Darling, do you know that this is the first time I've ever seen you smile? <laughs> I smile all the time. You listen to me, George Wesley Sanderson. You're going to live. You're going to travel. You're going to mingle with all the people worth knowing in government, politics, the theater, art. Wait, wait, wait. Now, when do I work? Oh, you can work as hard as you like. As long as you remember, you have to play hard, too. When do we start? Right now. That was, uh, what... Fifteen years ago, I was 30, she was 25. And the years haven't changed either of us. Well, not very much, anyhow. Life has been full of excitement, zest, and, of course, satisfaction. Because I've won some very well-publicized cases in this talk of a judgeship, but that's all for the future. The important thing is that for almost 15 years since she died, I haven't heard voices. You know, those voices. Until... Until last week. And it happened when I was alone. In the morning, for breakfast. May I have my pills, George? My pills. I want to live. Please, George. My pills. I've kept hearing them. I don't know what to make of it because after all she did say she's forgiven me. Why should I hear her now? Why? I don't understand it. Why now? In the case of delay versus international power, the precedent is clearly stated. Sally. Sally, what are you doing here? 
I'm here to tell you about a precedent which is going to be established right now. Oh, I thought you were in London. I was, and then I decided to come back here for some litigation. Litigation? With whom? With you. Oh? What, uh, what kind of litigation? I want to review the basis for our marriage. It is rooted in the factors of common interests. We're both alive, we like to do things, go places, do you agree? Sure. So why aren't we going and doing? Well, we, uh... Well, we what? Do you realize that for the past year you've been working day and night? Well, darling, it so happens we have some crucial cases. Do you want our relationship to change permanently? Do you want us to drift apart? Do you know you're a nut? Darling, a long time ago we talked about this. Nothing. No one ever stands still. People change. And if they do, so does the basis of their relationship. All right. We'll go ski. Turn your work over to the bright, young, eager beavers and let's you and I start having fun again. And we did. We traveled, we played, we danced, we enjoyed ourselves. And I even managed to get some good work done, too. We were never so happy. There was, of course, one small, dark cloud for me. I could hear Margaret's voice. I need my pills, George. Aren't you going to give me my pills? Please? Penny, for your thoughts, George. Mm. Oh, well, you couldn't buy my high-priced thoughts for a penny. You seem to be in a state of reverie. I was. As if you were listening to something. Oh, must be your imagination. As if... You were listening to voices. Voices? Are you sure you're all right? It's positively spooky. Spooky? Here in our apartment in the bright sunlight? Oh, no, you've got to look for your spooks in the dead of night. Well, I know what we both need. All right, tell me. A good, hard hour of tennis. Well, now, darling, I have to be at the office. You don't have to be anywhere except with me. Okay, you're on for one hour. That's out. <laughs> this set has one more game. Your luck won't hold forever. Oh, no, I don't need luck. I happen to be good. Oh, that was definitely out. Uh, I think I'm going to break your uh, service. Uh, oh. Well? George, what's the matter? It's nothing, dear. Well, I'm waiting, sir. Oh. 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 What is it, George? Is uh, something wrong? No, 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 I'm fine. You have a funny look on your face. Have I? Are you sure you're all right, yes, dear? Yes, yes, I'm sure. It's, it's, it's just... Just what? Oh, it's nothing. I, uh... I just had this little twinge in my back. But it's, it's gone now. But it wasn't gone. It wasn't much, but it didn't go away. And so that afternoon, instead of going to the office, I went to the doctor... I can't see anything. Could be a muscle strain. Uh, try a little heat at home. If it persists, we'll give you some physiotherapy. Doctor, it's uh, nothing serious, would you say? Well, right now it doesn't look serious. I looked very hard at the doctor. I tried to listen for another voice. His inner voice. Perhaps... Perhaps the voice he didn't even know he had. The voice I'd heard 15 years before with Margaret. When he predicted. But no, there was nothing. I sighed with relief. Pour me a cup of that coffee. Yeah, sure thing. How's the back this morning? Oh, fine, just fine. How about some tennis? If you'd like. Sure your back's okay? I said so, honey. I found out you'd seen the doctor the other day. Oh, well, it was uh, just a checkup. And the back? Oh, a twinge now and then. Oh. Everybody gets a twinge now and then. Dinner tonight at the Caswells. I better call her. Then we'll try a few sets. Do you love me? I think so. I think I love you, too. She left the room. I was all alone. 
For a week now, I've been hearing Margaret's voice. But now there wasn't a sound. I listened. But as mysteriously as it had begun, perhaps it was coming to an end. Maybe I was losing this... this ear I had for voices. And then I heard it. A voice. It was very indistinct at first, but I recognized it. It was my own voice. But I couldn't believe what it was saying. I didn't want to believe what it was saying. Sally. Oh, please, Sally. Sally, give me my pills. Please. Sally, I I must have my pills. Sally, aren't you going to give me my pills? Sally, don't kill me. I don't want to die. Sally, my pills. George. George, what's wrong? Sally... Sally, it's my back. I'll call the doctor. Yes, Sally, quickly. The pain is terrible. Sally, please. You won't kill me, will you? What are you talking about? When, when the time comes, you won't kill me. You won't, you won't, Sally. Or will you? Will you? Who knows? George and Margaret. That's one story. George and Sally... That's another. Yes, we often think, many of us, how wonderful if we could only hear voices from the future. Voices that could predict our fate. But maybe it's not such a good idea after all. Maybe it's better never to know. I'll be back in a moment. Who knows how to help you solve your shopping problems? Your Better Business Bureau knows. Sheriff, Sheriff, they're gone. Lock, stock, and barrel. Those low-down pole cats told me this new roof was guaranteed. She's leaking like a sieve. I'll help you with some good advice from the Better Business Bureau. Beware of the salesmen who offer such a guarantee. Roof waterproofing requires skill and judgment. It may take several treatments to completely waterproof your roof. Remember, no known process is 100% guaranteed. Thanks, Bob. Riding out. Looking for them ornery polecats, sir? No, looking for some buckets before we drown in here. Just another consumer tip from your Better Business Bureau. What are the voices we think we hear in the night? Are they merely dreams, fantasies, or our own wishes? Or are they real? And why shouldn't they be real? After all, reality is what we think it is. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Augusta Dabney, Leon Janney, and Suzanne Grossman. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now... A preview of our next tale. I like being Al Grissom. Then you can't be married to Mrs. Gloria Winters. I thought we were talking about divorce. You'll have to believe me that Leo won't give me a divorce. Now, go back again to me being Leo Winters. That was where you lost me. Well, you've seen this picture. Don't you see how easy it would be to take his place? Fine, fine, but what happens to him? Well, that's the problem, isn't it? Yeah, that's the problem. I thought maybe you could think of a way out. Yeah, I can, but I don't like it. Try it on me. No, I think you've already tried it on, and you like it. Maybe. Not maybe, positively. That's what you wanted to lay on me when you said you wanted to talk. (laughs) You're not only sexy, but you're smart. Yeah, you bet. Smart enough to stay away from murder. Well, who said anything about murder? I did, my lovely. I did. I said murder. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater 
for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Pleasant dreams.